Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. I'm here with Kyle and Leanne Hubner. How are you guys? You're coming in from a wild, crazy trip. Tell us all about the general overview of what you guys have done. Ah, well, we just uh, got back from a, was supposed to be a year, but turned out to be a nine month adventure around the world. We hit seven continents, 43 countries with um, ourselves and our five teenagers. People thought we were crazy when we said we were going to do this. And we uh, still and... think you are. <laughs> <laughs> you, in, fact, in fact, you just have proven that you're crazy. <laughs> No, it's all it's all good. It's all good. But uh, it was uh, a kind of a pipe dream uh, ten years ago that kind of led into one thing led to the other that just kind of made it come true. So we we really quite fortunate for the, have the opportunity. Yeah. Kyle. So we mm-hmm. go ahead, Kyle. We have, uh, so the the kids. Um, so we have three of our own who are thirteen, fifteen, and seventeen during the trip. Just turned eighteen. And then about four years ago, my sister passed away. Uh, she was a single mom, so we took in her, her four kids, really. And so two of them were younger and came to live with us. Um, and so they were 15 and 17 on the trip. The two older ones were in their senior year in college. So they, they had to finish college um, and, and couldn't really have the opportunity to, get to go on the trip. So we ended up with... 13-year-old girl, 15-year-old boy, 15-year-old girl, 17-year-old boy, 17-year-old boy. And Got it. So, so, so yeah. So. Three of your kids are biological? Yes. And the rest are synthetic? Well, they, they're, 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 they're robots. We're legal, yeah. <laughs> we're legal guardians. We're legal guardians. Yeah, they're for, they're for nieces and nephews. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so technically at the holidays, we have seven kids. <laughs> wow. But, Incredible. you know, for, for most of the year in the house, we have five. <laughs> and so. So which of you lunatics came up with this wacky idea? Well, it was certainly something that I had talked to Kyle about doing, you know, 10 years earlier, but it was always just a pipe dream. Um, you know, anytime he came home frustrated from his job, I would say, well, you know what, why don't we just do this? Uh, take a year off and <laughs> just travel. Just take a year off and travel. And so um, he's very logical and he definitely many times said, that's, that's, that's just, you know, insane. There's no way we could do that. Uh, and so it's, it's incredible. Sometimes you put a little seed and that seed starts to plant. <laughs> But they right. take- yeah, so so really, we didn't travel with the kids internationally for, you know, up until four years ago. And we're like, you know, they're not going to appreciate museums in France, you know, it's seven years old. Mm-hmm. So three, four years ago, we started off, we went to Vancouver, you know, that summer, you know, start easy, same time zone, you know, next country over. Um, we did a cruise to, to Mexico. Then the next summer we went to Iceland and they absolutely loved it. And they were literally like, this was our favorite vacation we've ever taken. And it was one of those journey vacations. We took a car and we rented it from, I know I'm going to say the capital name, Reykjavik, 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 um, and we drove around Ring Road. And um, it was like uh, no other place in the world we had been. It was almost like we were we were in a storybook or a children's storybook when we were there. You know, I mean, there's rolling hills, and there's flowers and waterfalls, balls, glaciers, waterfalls, glaciers, ice hiking, I mean, snowmobiling. Uh, and it's so relatively unpopulated that um, really you just are truly just enjoying nature at its best. And so uh, that trip kind of sparked a, a real like love of traveling or on a journey kind of vacation not just kind of a destination where you sit on a beach kind of vacation so i think that kind of sparked an interest in our kids and, and how so, old what was the age range of your kids at that time oh well they were so it was two years roughly. ago so they okay. would have been 11 13 and 15. yeah got it so okay middle childhood um, middle childhood <laughs> um so then really what happened is one of the big things that happened is our oldest son john got into opera singing and so the next summer, he spent a month in New York training with an opera professional program. He spent a month in San Francisco with Opera, San Francisco Opera Conservatory. And then he had a program in uh, Salzburg. With to, the Vienna, to, Phil- the Vienna, Vienna Philharmonic, Philharmonic to sing in the, in the Salzburg Festival. So we went, we took 
the kids over to Austria. And, you know, that's when I think we started to think more seriously, because at that point, I had been at Stamps 19 and a half years. And my goal was to make it to 20 and then kind of wrap up the corporate life. Yeah. So I knew that in six months I was going to have an opportunity like, you know, where I wouldn't be working. And then, you know, John started to get international stuff for the next summer. So he got accepted into a program that had performances in South Korea and Japan he got accepted into a program at the Sydney Opera House. Wow. So that's when, like, it yeah. started to come together where, you know, we're like, okay, kids, what do you think if we take a year and travel? The other thing that lined up perfectly is two of the kids were finishing eighth grade. So they were going into a different high school than their middle school. So that was the perfect time to take a gap year. You know, so we kind of figured, okay, Ashley's going to do homeschooling from the road for for sixth grade. The two that just finished eighth grade do a gap year, and then they just start high school fresh. You know, the two older ones were like, okay, the whole point of the trip is to learn. So we're like, there's no way they can be doing AP classes and a high school schedule from the road. So, you know, we're like, okay, it's a gap year. And it was toughest on them because, you know, their friends move ahead a year. So John was going into 12th grade, so his friends kind of moved ahead and graduated, you know, during his gap year. Um, but They were willing to take the risk. Yeah, and she then, very you proud know, of them. so then it was cool. John kind of created this opera program um, that once his kind of organized performances were done, he went and was singing kind of on all the continents and a lot of the countries he, he has this whole thing about, you know, opera in the U.S. is very, like, it's, you know, it, it's, you need money, large, it's large. the affluent, you know, older affluent crowd. And so he wanted to do this free concert series to, you know, kind of expose people of, you know, all incomes and cultures and backgrounds to, to the world of live opera. So it kind of fit in perfectly with the gap year. And so... You know, that's that's how it started, you know, and then, you know, you get into the real work and it was overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, just not even, you know, I think one of the things that surprised me was it wasn't even the travel stuff. It was all the other stuff, like just to get ready. Right. You know, we uh, the- Leanne, give us some examples of some of the travel stuff that you had to get ready. Well, for the first thing I did was talk to you because... <laughs> 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 because I knew you were the expert on this, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to discount the fact that you were truly an inspiration to Thank kind of you. lead us to even yes. consider this kind of, <laughs> this kind of trip, which is great. Um, but I don't but... have any kids, that, at least that I know of. <laughs> 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 well, um, but yeah, so in terms of just getting ready for this, first of all, it's just like, well, where, right? And so where are we going to go? Um, and so Kyle had a great idea of going to all of our kids and having them create a list and tell us 10 countries that you want to go visit. We're figuring, you know, probably half of the countries would be similar. And, you know, we get back the list. They're all different countries. <laughs> <laughs> And we're like, how do we make everybody happy? So we kind of rethought we should have, why didn't we say five countries? <laughs> but what was interesting is that the countries that they chose were really um, based on their own sort of interest in a sense. So, um, for instance, our uh, one of our teens uh, it likes adventure and hiking and exploring. And so their, uh, that list was more uh, the, the South America countries and Australia. Uh, yeah, Switzerland for skiing and, and things like that. And then John, um, you know, the opera singer, is a little bit more into cultures and um, indigenous indigenous. Uh, indigenous cultures uh, and histories, deep into history. So his list contained um, Tibet and Turkey. China, Tibet, Russia, Uh, Turkey, Egypt. And I'm I'm going, John, did you pick the, like, least safe places (laughs) on purpose? Well, (laughs) all countries have their pros and cons, right? But certainly... um, 
we did cross reference the countries that they chose with uh, what was on the U.S. Uh, advisory list. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so that was a concern only because it's a family. Obviously, we want to make sure that we're we're going to places that have kind of in- infrastructures where we would feel comfortable traveling with a family. Right. And, and by, so, the, by the way, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but on your website, which is globalteenadventures.com, you have a ranking under your rankings menu, like the top 10 uh, trip rankings. Now, is that top 10 list that ev- each one of your children kind of made a top 10 list? Is that after the trip or was that before the trip? Great question. It is after the trip. Okay, got it. So it so would they be did, interesting they to did, cross they did a list. They did a list of the top 10 before the trip, and then now this is the one after the trip. Yes, yes, Yes. and um, yeah, and I think that um, there were definitely countries on the list that we entered into that some of us had never even heard of or really (laughs) never thought of, maybe couldn't even spell. (laughs) So um, (laughs) it was so eye-opening, and you know, I had already been to many countries before, a couple, couple dozen countries before we left. But I would have to say that this was, this to me was just such a, an eye-opening trip to just be able to experience this kind of life of the journey over a long-term travel opportunity. And it was really such a, such a gift. And so Kyle, I think one, one, go ahead. one of the things is when you looked at the lists, all seven of our lists, what became clear is that we were gonna have to go to a lot of places for a shorter period of time. And so the strategy was kind of to make sure we were, you know, going to places that met everyone's interests. You know, so some people weren't really interested in Tibet, but then, you know, really wanted to go to Paris. And so, you know, our our strategy became, you know, expose them to as much of the world as possible and let them figure out where they want to come back and spend more time, you know, in their life, you know, during their life when they get the opportunities. Did you guys see ever a situation where like one of your children says, there's no fucking way I'm going to go to Tibet. No way. And I hate that place. And then they got there and they're like, wow, this is amazing or whatever country or whatever place. I I actually don't think our kids were, uh, they were very open-minded to where we were going. It was probably less what we were doing. <laughs> so, um, but for the most part, it was smooth sailing. I mean, they were very, very open-minded to what we were doing. But there was certainly a day or two there where I'm not going to another museum today. <laughs> okay, I remember one day um, our oldest son really took that role of being the oldest and helped plan. And he would come to us the night before and say, "This is how I've." planned out tomorrow and this is the kind of teen part of the day and it would be like bowling <laughs> you know or, you know like this this will this keeps the group together and so i think he played a very nice role in between being a, a adult a negotiator and kind of team teen uh teen team player there but um yeah no i really think um we really lucked out. We really lucked out in the sense that their minds were really open to experiencing, you know, all that we had to see and do. So, yeah, I, I would say it's it's not so much that they weren't like we're not going to a place, but there were definitely countries where, you know, we didn't know much about it. Our expectations were very low and then we were kind of blown away, you know, and so I know for me. Like Myanmar was one of my favorite countries. Like I didn't even know where that was, you know, mm-hmm. before I started planning the trip. You know, it was funny. We we were in Helsinki. We took the ferry to St. Petersburg, and so when I'm booking it, they say, "Hey, for nineteen dollars, do you want to go to Tallinn?" And I'm like, "John, what do you think? Should we go to Tallinn?" He's like, "Oh yeah, that would be awesome. Let's go to Tallinn." So I'm like, okay, 19 bucks, we got a towel. And he's like, well, then you got to go to Riga. It's right next to each other. And, <laughs> you know, so it wasn't even on our original list, but we ended up building in, you know, and it was just like two and a half days in, you know, Estonia, Latvia. And then we did a one day trip to, to the Hill of Crosses in Lithuania. And I love that. I love that part of the trip. And it was like, I had no expectations. I never would have put it on my list. You know, uh, so I think there are countries like that. Everyone loved Croatia. That Mm -hmm. was like across the board, 
you know, and we did a lot of different things. We went to Zagreb, Plitvice, Split, and Dubrovnik, and then a day trip to Bosnia. And so, you know, that was one country that I don't think the kids really had any expectations, and they all ended up loving it. And I think that that makes a good point that the more time you can spend into a country, the better experience that you can get from it. Because visiting four cities in that uh, country just made it more memorable for us. Um, and you could see a lot of kind of similarities to the, the cities, but you see some differences, obviously, especially ar- ar- um, from an architectural spe- uh, perspective. What so, was yeah. some of the, what was a low point in the trip where everything, because finally in the end, COVID came and kind of put a close to your uh, close to your trip. So maybe that was the low point, but what was for you the low point of the trip? Well. For me, the low point was the high point <laughs> because <laughs> because it was going to Tibet. Uh, we all were prepared for altitude sickness. We had all taken, um, I forget what the medication was, but we took one to help us adjust. Um, and it was my birthday, the end of September. And um, it turns out that um, all of us ended up being impacted by the altitude uh, sickness and nausea and um, so we actually it was the only time we actually had to alter our itinerary we planned about two months ahead um, and this guy did a great job Kyle you mm-hmm. are you know planner extraordinary I will give all the credit to to my husband mm-hmm. um, but at this point we had to uh, go to a hospital um, in Tibet John had a really bad cough and John had a really bad cough at this point and so um, we had to kind of alter our plans for at least for 24 hours um, we just kind of you know saw how it went um, and um, but we were taken care of so well I mean the people were so kind to us. They were really worried about us. Um, we got oxygen tanks delivered to our hotel room wow. to help us, and they actually have that. You know, they they regularly have that in their hotels because this is not a, an uncommon thing to if you're not used to altitude. Um, they are, and it's at what's twelve thousand feet. Well, Lhasa is yeah, it's like eleven something, and yeah. then we drove from Lhasa to Mount Everest, and so. Eventually, you get to sixteen thousand. Yeah, and you know, so like five thousand meters. Yeah, so, all um, all when, six of the six of the seven of us were under the advisable like 90 percent oxygen. So yeah. we all took oxygen at that point. So that was that was good. Let's take a step back. Where did you did you fly into Lhasa? Yeah. Yes. So okay. we so we the route was from sea level, and well, yeah, from China. So we flew to Beijing. And then we went from Beijing by train to Xi'an and Xi'an to Chengdu. So Chengdu is one of the places that was on Ashley's list with the giant pandas. She's like, if we don't go to Chengdu, I'm not going on the trip. <laughs> <laughs> so we had these deals. We had so we, deals. <laughs> we flew from Chengdu, which is pretty much sea level, to Lhasa, okay. like in one fell swoop. And then from Lhasa, you know, you just we leave by a van and just keep going higher so in higher. Lhasa were you already experiencing altitude yeah. sickness already yeah. okay and, and then did, and then we... wait a second so you were experiencing altitude sickness and then somebody had the bright idea to then go drive to Everest <laughs> <laughs> well, that was on our plan. <laughs> well, we we had planned we had planned a couple of days to to okay. simulate right, which you're okay. supposed to do. We probably I mean like needed... acclimatize. Yes, we had okay. already been climatizing, and so. But you were um... sick, though. I mean, in other words, you had altitude <laughs> sickness. I mean, no, so we... your your acclimatizing wasn't going As very we well. Went. Well, as yeah. we went higher, as we went higher, which is why we took the extra day to stop. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it was and, Shigatse at like 14,000 feet that we actually went to the hospital and said, we got to just stop here. We can't keep going higher. Yeah. So in retrospect, but, if somebody's listening to this and, they were go- and they're going to Lhasa and let's say they arrived there and they're already feeling altitude sickness, you would just advise them to spend an extra couple yeah. of days before yeah. moving yeah. on to Everest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of- we... We, we only gave our, we gave ourselves three days in Lhasa, but it wasn't enough. Yeah, we could probably use an extra. But I think that's one of the, the things is that the more people that are in your group, probably the more flexibility you need to have in your schedule. And it was difficult for us to continue to, to, to have a lot of flexibility because we were relying on plane flights, right? If we didn't get to this one, we needed to get this one. And it's a little different if you're buying one plane ticket versus you're buying seven plane tickets, right? That's a huge uh, financial um, 
cost that you have to do if you don't make your journey times. So, um, but we were able to do it and it actually turned out to be the, a better situation because, uh, of the, the accommodations were actually better at the place that we stayed back at. So that was good. So, so it, it worked out. And <laughs> I have to say, you know, so we go to the hospital and you're like, that was one of our kind of concerns is like, what do you have to go to? What if you have to go to hospital and, you know, a less developed country? Well, it was a, you know, modern hospital Brand that new. built Six within months. the last like yeah year we got, John got, saw the doctor, got an x-ray and ultrasound. All seven of us got oxygen and the bill was no insurance. Just the bill was like $61. Wow. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's better than the U S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we had a lot of fears before the trip. I mean, I certainly did myself. Uh, and of course that's one of the fears, right? It's just like, what if we need healthcare? And so, um, the few times that we had to access healthcare, it was great. It was just as good as we would have anticipated in our own country. So, um, fortunately we didn't have anything super serious, um, uh, when we were on the trip, but you know, that was good. That was good. We recovered. So that was great. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we be get back, we're going to talk more about some of the details and some of the best stories that you guys have from this trip. And we're back to the Wander Learn podcast here with Kyle and Leanne Hubner, who went on a trip to all seven continents. Is it 43 countries? Am I right? Yep. Yep. 43 countries. Amazing. 122 cities. And with uh, like 20 children on your back? <laughs> I felt like that way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so there were seven of you going around together. Um, were there logistical challenges that that really only a family of seven faced that it, had it just been you two together, you would have never faced? Give us an example of well, where that really hit the fan. Apparently, you can't buy plane tickets for seven people easily. <laughs> <laughs> what <is the> <laughs> so uh, most apps are written, weren't most apps written yeah, for some, the A lot six. of them limit it you to six at a time. <laughs> so just right there yeah, was, to, like, a, was a little bit Make two different like, reservations under two different, <laughs> yes. two different orders. Yeah. So, so you really, so okay. they, why did they limit people to six tickets at a time? I think it's just the app. They just assume that people don't have more than four children these days, I suppose. <laughs> but um, so right there. But I think the other um, the other piece, obviously, is just the managing of the luggage, right? So we couldn't just get in a regular taxi, right? We pretty much always had to make sure that we either get two taxis or try to book a larger van if we possibly could. So, and obviously, we wanted to um, take this trip in and not totally break the bank. So we had to really be careful about. Um, you know, little, little costs like that, that could just add up and, and blow our budget. So, uh, that was one thing. So managing luggage. What How, else? So tell us about the luggage situation. Like, did you limit each kid to one piece of luggage? We started off with one large backpack and one small backpack. Um, but as we went around the world, we realized that uh, luggage checking in in the United States is very different than abroad. Like there's all sorts of different uh, restrictions on weights and everything. So we constantly were kind of reshuffling our our, our luggage into each other's. Um, and we did end up kind of adding a bag here and there, but purging, right? So, you know, we did pick up some souvenirs along the way. So we had what we called a shed box. <laughs> and every month or so we would send a shed box home and everyone knew that that was coming. And so by the end of the trip, we're, we, you know, we pretty much just have a couple pairs of underwears <laughs> and then two outfits, you know, but, um, so yeah, but over time we, we, we probably got even well, better with it. Yeah. I mean, we, we actually started off and like had this like, grand plan that like everyone was going to have you know a backpack that they could carry on and put above and then like a backpack you know for their day backpack and we wouldn't have to check any bags well like right like going from canada back to new york city like we're in the airport and it's like 
they have these self check in things, luggage things. So it's like, you know, trying to like go through this whole process like seven different times, like who's got what luggage, like and so we get through and we get to the security and we had all our like liquids and travel size things, but we get there and they're like there's like a little like hundred milliliter Ziploc bag and they're like everything has to fit in this bag. <laughs> so here all seven of us are like opening our bags, or right? like taking like stuff out, trying to fit it in, the lines piling up behind us, like security's like, look, you gotta get out of get out of the way. And like so like I'm like, okay, like that, this isn't gonna work. And you know, then when we were leaving from JFK to uh to London they wanted to weigh our carry-on bags and so then like okay like we were over the limit so now we're in the middle of kennedy opening every bag redistributing weight trying to reweigh everything and like like this strategy is not going to work so we switched to checking bags and then it became like okay all the toiletries go in the check bag everybody gets one check bag and one you know, backpack that they take on the plane with them. And so you just had to build in extra time to get to the airport. And, you know, we're like, when there's a self check-in machine, we're like, nope, we want to go wait online. Way easier to have, like, just give seven passports to the agent and say, here's our seven bags, check us in. And I will say one thing that I I thought we learned as we went along and we are much better travelers at the end of the trip than we were at the beginning trip. So now it's like smooth sailing. We know exactly how to get through everything. But um, I I think that we realize how little you really do need on a day-to-day basis. And when we came home and started transitioning back to all the stuff we have at home i'm sitting there just giving away clothes i'm like i don't obviously i don't need this i didn't use it for a year um and so uh, you realize that your stuff can become a burden and so that's one life lesson that i i have now is that um you need a lot less stuff in this world than you think yeah Yeah, no that's very wise there was one story so you know every time i'm making a reservation or getting a visa it's like all seven people names birth dates passport numbers expiration date like i'm entering a massive amount of data and so it's like my fear is always like okay i messed something up in the data entry and so there was one where we were in i forget the country it was in asia and i had misspelled ashlyn's name and so we go to check in and the guy like checks her in but then he's like wait the name on the ticket doesn't match the passport i can't check you in so like he's like you got to go over to this other guy you know across the airport so ashlyn kind of gets this look like am i gonna get left here (laughs) which we would never (laughs) do we would never do so we go we go across (laughs) the airport and i go to that guy and he's like typing it in he goes well the other guy already checked you in, so I can't change any of the information. So, like, we had to go back to that guy and, like, beg and plead, like, for him. And, like, the other guy said, you can, you know, you have it open, you can change it. And Another life lesson, he, so he, just be really nice all the time. <laughs> so we got right. through him, but then we, like, have to go through security, and we're like, what if security notices, like... Know, you know that so- things will go wrong and that <laughs> um, you just have to overcome them and you learn learn through the experience. So, <laughs> Yeah, we had a, a couple of... I mean, overall, it went remarkably smooth. Like, we didn't miss a flight. We didn't miss a connection. Our flights were delayed, you know, a couple times, but where we didn't have a connecting yeah. flight. All those so- fears were... But, but we had little, I mean, there were little hiccups. Always like, hiccups. With, you know. But you guess that's just what you have to prepare for when you, whenever you travel, but especially when you travel long term. Yeah, so right. we were in one. one another question. What? Because two more okay. other questions. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. You were, you were saying? Yeah, go ahead. She won't oh. let me answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted okay. to get your other topics. <laughs> okay. No, but I was just curious about, you know, like the, there. Were, you said that everything went smoothly, but really at the end, something called COVID-19 came along and threw a big monkey wrench into your plans. Tell us about that. Well, at the time we were uh, in Turkey, uh, in Cappadocia, 
when uh, President Trump uh, or Mike Pompeo uh, announced all Americans come back. And we were just like, hey, we have like three and a half more months left on our trip. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, and so um, we, and sorry, what were uh, those countries or, or that you were or region, at least that during those three months, what were you going to be going to? So, so we were in, in the Middle East, basically. We were heading off to, to Egypt, really? and we were watching this uh, COVID for, for at least a month. We were already traveling very safely. We were wearing masks all the time. We had gloves and hand sanitizers. And so we had all of the things that are now commonplace in our society uh, with us, and we were able to obtain them in, in, in these countries. So... Uh, we headed off to, to Egypt to, we really wanted to hit our seventh continent. Um, and it was in Egypt when we realized that things were just, the ability to be able to continue to travel was going to be um, very, very difficult. Borders were starting to shut around the world. Um, so it actually, we got really lucky in terms of like the ordering of the countries we went to. So like we had, we had done China and all of Asia in the fall. We had done half of Europe in the fall. So, you know, the COVID starts to, you know, hit in China and then spreads to Europe. Well, in January, February, in the first part of March, we were in South and Central America where there were no cases. No reported cases. No reported time. cases. So we kind of like, we're watching this thing from afar not really knowing like how bad it's going to get but we're like okay for the present you know we're in colombia and peru and ecuador and there's no cases and so it's when we we left brazil in, after the first week in march and went to turkey and then we were in turkey and we were you know in in uh, istanbul and then cappadocia and that's when like borders started to shut at countries even though there weren't a lot of cases so we were going after egypt we were going to israel jordan oman qatar uae well israel closes their border oman closes their border and we're like okay like we're obviously not going from egypt to the middle east anymore but it's like i did not want to give up like I'm like, okay, like you got safety. So when we're in Turkey, we're like, I'm trying to plan a trip around the Balkans. I'm like, okay, well, there's no cases. It's Southern Europe. You don't have to get on planes. So like, and Leanne's like, you're crazy, you know? So I'm working with this company in Albania to try and plan, you know, a driving tour around, you know, all those countries. And then, but we're like, we have to get to Egypt. It's our seventh continent. Like, and so we flew to Egypt, to Cairo. We spent a day, did the, you know, Great Pyramids in, in Cairo. And then, you know, our son sends us a story about an American who got a false positive test in Egypt. And they put him in a military hospital. And he was still there like six weeks later, even though he had been like, you know, tested negative for like 10 straight times and so they were taking good care you know of from they cairo were we were going to go aswan and luxor so we were going deeper into egypt and i was like okay leanne we got to pull the plug we threw them in the towel i'm like we got our seventh continent but at that point like i was like okay you know and and that's when the u.s was like all citizens come back to the u.s but our house was rented, so we didn't want to kick out our tenants because we had made a promise to them. So we needed to kind of figure out where could we go for a couple of months. So we just tried to, to figure out, okay, well, let's get closer to the United States at the very least. Um, but it's a really cool question. Like, we got to sit there and say, we can go anywhere in the world to quarantine for the next three and a half months. <laughs> where do we go? Siberia, like, was, of course. Yeah, it was really cool. Like. <laughs> So, you know, I was looking at these like remote islands in the, you know, Oceania, like Vanuatu and Nauru, and, like, but it takes like five days to get back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we ended up settling on the Caribbean because it's close to the East Coast. You know, it's like a four hour flight to get back to the, the U.S., the East Coast. 
My mom's in Florida. Leanne's mom's in New Jersey. In case so we're we like, had to come back. You know, if we have to come, we're, we're close. We could, we could row back. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's cool. So I just like, we just started doing these like criterias. Okay, let's take the Caribbean, you know, look up unsafe, you know, countries in the Caribbean, take those off the list. You know, we took off countries with populations greater than 100,000, you know, looked for low population density countries. And then we did, you know, look, there's like a world health ranking of the countries. And so at the end, we actually had two that were on the top 100 health line. It was Dominica and Antigua. And so Antigua is like 80,000 people. It's very low population density. And so we go on Airbnb in the fir- Antigua. The first thing that pops up is this like gorgeous house on like in a remote cove. So like it's on the other side of the island from the capital and the ports. Like there's like one other house on this cove. It's like not near like anything. And, you know, at that point, like the Airbnb owner lived in Vancouver. Her sister had just canceled. So she had just put the house back on like three hours before another I did lucky the search. break. Another lucky break. And because we <laughs> were no getting way. there long term, you know, we were able to work out a good deal with her. Where I mean, we ended up paying less yeah. than we would have if we came back here and had to rent an Airbnb yeah, so we, in Los Angeles. We really liked that, and I think the one thing about Antigua in general was just. We were so we were in a lockdown situation for a few weeks in a you know yes. we're obviously not from that country, but the people there took such good care of us. Um, they were neighbors. They there was a driver that was just uh, went over and beyond, making sure that we were safe, making sure we had food. Um, I actually got hurt when I was in Antigua. I fell um, I, well, during a just a, a typical little kind of hike. Uh, a car driver stopped right away. Opened opened his door and said, I'll take you wherever you need to go. Did you break your leg? I broke my ankle. Yeah. And um, it was just down a gravelly hill and, you know, just a typical like hike you might take any, any time when you're on a, on a, did you know you broke it or as soon as it happened? Yeah. I I knew it was broken, but Mm -hmm. um, he actually, the, the driver had driven by, turned around, came back and said, I saw you fall. Where can wow. I take you? Wow! And so, and we were we were out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it, we were so lucky. I, mean, I couldn't yeah. even walk a single step. Wow. And so, um, even from that, um, another neighbor dropped everything. She called uh, to to a doctor to make sure that I got a cast on right away. And mm-hmm. and people brought me soup and food. And, and you know, uh, it was just really so. Um, I don't know. My heart is just so warmed by the hundreds of people that were so warm to us during our trip and just welcomed us into their countries, taught us about their countries, gave us their food. Um, and I know you've had similar experiences in your travels. Um, but I, I really, I hope that my children, uh, you know, can really appreciate the world in a way that is just amazing. Cause people that had, that didn't have a lot still were giving and giving and giving, um, to us as as people that they knew were just visiting their country. They were so proud of their country and so proud of their cultures that they shared it with us. How did your children deal with the COVID crisis? Did they just roll with the punches pretty easily or did any of them kind of really get, you know, Well, challenged? we went... We went from going like 150 miles an hour traveling to now settled in this house. And and because we were in lockdown, we were kind of stuck in this house, right? Um, I would have to say that this, I almost see a a new level of maturity in our kids after the nine months. Um, They, we sat them down and said, okay, now it's time to really focus on your academics and your goals of your life. And so we used the COVID experience of quarantining in a place that we didn't even know to do that. And so one of our um, children needed uh, to catch up on her curriculum because she was the one who was uh, homeschooling during the year and our four older teens all chose a subject all you know every day they created a school for her Mm -hmm. going through the standard of curriculum that she needed to get through in like you know rocket speed time two of our children uh two teens uh sat sat down in their rooms and wrote a book they both wrote books and they'll be coming out in the next year um which is have they picked the title yet yeah, so one of them is, uh, the working title is Small Countries, Big Cultures. Okay. So he chose uh, 10 of the- Which, which kid um, is this, sorry? 
This is John, the okay, opera John, singer. The opera singer, yeah. Uh, he likes the culture, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so he uh, chose that as his, as his working title. And basically, he just did a deep dive into the histories and cultures of 10 of the countries that are lesser known. You know, he didn't choose the large, the France and the China. He chose smaller countries that he felt that, um, you know, he had never really been exposed to any kind of deep way in his kind of American curriculum. And so we're really, it's just such a great book and I can't wait for people to see it. So uh, we will have it on Global Teen Adventures in a couple of months time. So if you Global are listening to this, dot com. Will, yes, no, it's great. Um, we will we'll put the our, book up there for you to buy it. Okay. And, and, and we'll our, put a code for your Anybody who says your your name, your podcast, we'll give them a twenty percent off. Awesome. <laughs> That's the NBA in us. And then my our nephew wrote a book on. He's very into uh, environmental science, and so his book looked at the places we went to, the kind of best environmental practices of the countries and the worst environmental practices, and kind of did this book like you know, what we can learn from kind of the best ones and then the ones that, that are not doing well and, on that front. And that's the nephew who actually did a lot of uh, environmental cleanups with our other son. Uh, they're both Eagle Scout candidates. And um, so whenever they saw a place was dirty, they would just go and get some gloves and, and some um, trash bags and just start picking it up. So we did that in Thailand. We did that in Borneo. We did it in Antigua. Uh, uh -huh. where, you know, when you have a group of seven, you can get a lot done. So service was an important element to our trip. Uh, it included the free concerts that John did. There was environmental cleanups. We taught English in, in Indonesia, and we volunteered at the Panda Research Center. So that was uh, an element I just wanted to kind of throw up because so important to have that kind of service element to any long travel um, trip. Yeah, and it's hard when you're constantly moving. Now, what was some of the lessons that you learned anybody who has children listening to this and they want to travel with their children, what advice would you give them to how to keep harmony in the family uh, when there's so many disparate desires? I would say one thing is to really involve the children in where you're going. And that was the one lesson that we learned, I think, is uh, when when our teens really just kind of took over that, that what they wanted to see. And of course, we made sure that there was an educational enrichment and aspect, uh, aspect to most of what we did. You do have to have a balance between fun and and learning. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of fun and learning that can happen together as well. So, um, and I really, we continue to kind of put into our kids what a privileged travel is. It really is not something that, you know, is affordable to everybody in the world. And, and we're, we're fortunate that we were able to do this, um, but it really is a gift. And to really look at every day that you have on earth as a gift, especially when you're traveling, it's just a blessing. And so having that depreciation and, and, and our kids have been really appreciative of, of the opportunity to be able to get to, to do this. So I would say also um, just teaching the tolerance. Like I think in today's world, we see how, tolerance is an inclusivity is so important of a goal and um you know to be welcomed so warmly in other places i expect that same from my kids when people are welcomed into our house or into our country so i want people our kids to have that kind of feeling so yeah i mean i think one of the original goals of the trip is the world has just become a global place and I remember at our HBS reunion, like 10 years ago, they put up a slide that compared to, you know, when we went to now, like the number of international cases when we went, you know, it was now like 70%. It was like 20 when we went, the number of internationals. And you could just look at this slide and see how the world is changing and that you're, it's really hard to learn about culture, people, language, history, sitting in a classroom. Like reading is so much different than experiencing. And so, you know, that was one of our like core philosophies is that, you know, it was a year of global education, you know, on the ground with the locals in the local countries where you just learn a different way and experience things a different way. 
So that was that was one of the, you know, the huge goals in terms of, you know, managing it. One of the key things we did was to make sure to build in just down weeks, you know, like in Thailand, you know, we stayed at Riley Beach, you know, pool beach and kind of just said, hey, if you want to do some activities, great. But if you want to just sit and relax for a week, you sit and relax for a week. So, you know, we we tried to make sure we built in a couple, you know, at least five day periods where it was just really downtime. Uh, the other important thing, I think, was we let kids opt out of stuff on any given day. If it was a if it was appropriate and it was yeah we felt like it was safe for them to do it that but day. it would you know it, they it couldn't be like where they're opting out of stuff five days in a row but on any given day if someone's like I'm just tired fatigued like take the day off you know so I think that was important that they could kind of just raise their hand and say you know okay I I need a break today would they um, would those kids stay in the hotel room or would they go out and just wander the streets. No, no, we, okay. they really had to kind of stay in the okay. accommodations. And that's okay. why it was super important. It depended on where we stayed. There were certainly places I've said, well, no, I'm not going to, I don't feel comfortable with that today. So it really kind of just did, really depended on whether it was possible or not. So if it looked like we could have a chance to come down to time, we, we certainly did. And, and for the most part, um, you know, only really one of our kids really felt like she needed more downtime than the others. And she was the youngest. So, but hmm. They, uh, you know, I got to give my kids credit. I mean, we really pushed hard on this trip in terms of the velocity of things that we were expecting our kids to do. The pace was super high. And I think that it was almost welcomed in a sense to do the, the, have that Antigua slowdown period before we came back home. And when I first envisioned this trip, I actually envisioned it more like a month in one spot so that we could really get to know the culture. And I felt like when we were in the Caribbean, because we were just kind of there, I did feel like we, we really just digested the culture more in terms of, you know, we learned a lot about the history of the plantations in the Caribbean because we actually visited a former plantation, which was later, you know, made into actually a a sugar company. Um, And then, you know, we read all about that kind of history that happened in this small uh, nation. It was only made a, na- a UN nation in 1981. It had been a British colony up until 1981, which seems so late in in in, in the history of the world. Uh, one of the youngest countries we visited, and so um, yeah, no, those I, are kind of that's how I felt. <laughs> I think the other thing we did was we also broke up the continents. So we went to Europe, and then we went to Asia. Then we came back to Europe. Then we went back to Asia. And I think that was important because if you if we had done like four months in Europe or three months in Europe, three straight months in Asia, the kids that weren't as into that, you know, continent start to get bored and fatigued. But by kind of breaking it up and going back and forth, you know, the kids that liked Europe better were, you know, OK, well, it's three weeks, four weeks in Asia. Then we go back to Europe. The people that like Asia better, it's like, OK, it's four weeks in Europe and then we go to Asia. So. I think that helped kind of, you know, break it up and and spread around the types of things we did for the, you know, different interests of the kids. And and one thing I just would add is anyone that is thinking about a trip like this, um, I truly believe, and of course now with COVID, it kind of changes the game slightly, um, but, you know, as travel kind of rebounds, I would say that there are, there are, all sorts of budget levels for any type of traveler Um, and just having a sabbatical in any kind of sense even if you can only do it for two months or three months or you know we could do it for a whole whole summer um, i would just encourage this kind of concept of a journey because we were so interdependent on each other as a family and one of our goals was you know here we had these two uh new children into our family, our niece and nephew, and our three biological children. And we really were trying to help bond them for the long term because they, you know, they were kind of a a blended family. And I think we really achieved that. Like they're truly independent of each other. They're each other's best friends in a sense. And um, I'm really, I'm really happy that we embarked on this journey. Uh, It did cost some money, but I would say that 
that that any family that wants to do this with enough planning and saving could make it happen because travel there's there's all sorts of levels of travels and and it you know there are countries out there that are actually incredibly inexpensive to travel in especially in southeast asia and you can really enjoy a great trip and a great experience um we we dipped ourselves in in ritual baths in um in indonesia uh, uh in bali temple. we dumped it we we got all dressed up and we you know the, the tour guide wanted us to do this and so we said okay so we'll do it and it, and we got to really experience uh their you know their lifestyles and we we walked uh with tibetans around the city of lhasa um just in their typical like group of people as they do the prayer wheels and they are you know practicing their tibetan buddhism and i mean we're, we just had so many we got to, we were invited into indigenous villages where they would feed us exactly what they eat. Um, we felt like we were in a survivor episode, right? Um, and so, well, you know, and you know, here I'm thinking all these fears. I'm like, oh my God, what if we lose something or we get stolen or we lose a child or, and you know, none of that happened. We were just e either, you know, uh, you know, the little things that did happen were just kind of hiccups. And so I would just say, face your fears and just, you know, uh, you know, plan for safety and you, and you can make it, make it work. So I would encourage anyone and, and feel free to reach out to us at our website. If, if any family is thinking about doing this, cause we figured out some of the quirks. <laughs> yeah. Global teen adventures.com has a really an amazing resource. You guys have done a, an incredible job. There's so many, uh, there's so much information that you guys I don't even know where you found the time to do it. Cause a lot of it was, was there. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but just focusing on the family aspect, uh, what are some money saving tips? Because people are listening to this. they might be saying, you know what? I would love to take my family on a vacation or on a sabbatical of two, three months, but how the hell can I afford it? What are some ways to kind of cut down the costs that you just, um, well, one thing that we did, I think, well, and I think this might change in the post-COVID era, is we would always look for accommodations that had breakfast included. Because a breakfast included means you can stock up. And they yeah. usually don't care if you grab an extra banana for your day. Right. So, um, and the extra cost, we did not find it to be prohibitive. Um, we were always also balancing this idea of, is it cheaper to stay in an Airbnb or is it cheaper to stay in hotels? And it really depends. You have to really shop around and look for. Another thing I think we did really well, Kyle did excellently, it was just kind of planning a couple months ahead. Um, there are a few uh, websites that are also like really good at just price, uh, like finding, you know, you can use websites or I mean, sorry, apps to help find things super inexpensively. Um, Kyle, why don't you share, are, yeah. uh, since you're the, Kyle, share those apps <laughs> that, that you liked. That you love. Well, so, okay, so I will, but I did want to answer. So the, you know, I think one of the keys is the expensive cities we were really flexible on getting like cheap accommodations that were not ideal you know in sydney we got an airbnb with one bedroom and one bathroom and the kids were sleeping on the couch and like you know mattresses on the floor and we kind of figured you know we're going to be out all day most of the day anyway so you know, and so we really, you know, it was like Dublin was expensive, Munich, Sydney, and all those places. We caught kind of, you know, pretty low, you know, budget Airbnbs and just, no, we had to be a flexible. We were going to be out most of the day. And then, you know, when in places that were cheaper, you know, where it was like, hey, we're going to do less during the day, you know for you know still less than that you can get an airbnb that's a lot nicer you know in a, in a cheaper country so you know i think that was one of the things we saw um the apps trip it was the number one app managing all this you know you make a reservation you forward the email to trip it it's got everything in there and with seven people all seven of us had access to it everybody knew you know where what the schedule was where we were going when uh, Skyscanner was really good for the international flights. The other biggest thing is the throwaway tickets. Because we were going one way everywhere, we, I always looked and saw like, if you put a round trip in, 
even if you don't use the second ticket, a lot of times it's cheaper than the one-way flight. Wow. So like going from Egypt to Antigua, um, I saved, I, I got to cut the price by like 30% just getting a round trip ticket and just throwing away the second ticket. Really? And it takes a lot of work because you're like, you got to set them one way, find the best price, the time, you know, transfers, and then, you know, start playing around with round trip dates. And so some of the times you had to sit there for 20 minutes plugging in every date for the next three months. And all of a sudden it's like two months out, the price like falls, you know, fall, falls through the floor. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of variables, you know, in the flights, right? Like usually flights, early morning and late at night are cheaper than the midday flights. So you got to kind of say, okay, you know, kids were going to have to get up at 4 a.m. to get this, you know, 6.30 flight, but you can save a lot of money over, you know, sleeping until nine and getting the 12 o'clock flight. Mm -hmm. The one thing, you know, we, I had to really be cognizant is getting in late in countries that, you know, it might, you know, we felt like there might be a safety concern, you know, getting into Turkey at one in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. And having to get into Istanbul. So, you know, but there's always, you but know, that's any place. looking that's at any direct place. flights <laughs> versus layovers, you know, like it, it takes a lot of work, but if you're diligent, you can really find ways to save money, uh, you know, especially on air travel and, and the accommodations. Now, how did you guys do the blogging? Because your blog, I, I would get your emails uh, every couple of days and I was just, just blown away by the level of you know detail, length. I was like, where do these guys have the time to write you know, all these details? I mean, and, and why did you do it also? I mean, so tell us a little bit about that whole blogging experience. I, I know that um, when I first started traveling in my early 20s, I look back at those travel blogs and I realize how much you don't remember and how much it brings you back to that day when you've actually really, you know, categorize, like just even just write your thought stuff for that day. And so I knew it was really important to me and Kyle really wanted to blog as well. So we would actually almost like... Um, we would trade off as like, okay, I started it. Why don't you finish it? I know it's not perfect on the website. We need to, need to edit them a little bit, but we just said we would think it'd be better to just get out even something that's not completely perfect or not completely edited. Um, so many people followed us on our journey, our friends, our families, acquaintances. So we walk around town and we're like, oh my God, I love this story about the scorpion. And, you know, and we tried to share the, the, the funniest elements of the day to make it more entertaining for people because a lot of funny things happen to you, right like just right. it's just funny right like um whether it's language barriers or um animals that you run into in the street I, I think we had at least 10 different animals that came into the middle of the street wherever we were <laughs> some that we didn't even recognize what the animals were um <laughs> which was a great teaching moment for our kids as well so um yeah no I mean those are the the moments so we really stayed up in the middle of the night and um you know just did it on airplanes and anytime we were riding we're just like you know, on our phones, just writing it out. So it was important yeah. to us. Yeah. I mean, I think we knew we were going to do so much stuff. If we didn't take the time to write it and document everything we did on a day by day basis, we would never remember like everything that happened, you know, during, during the nine, you know, what was going to be 12 months. And so, you know, as Leanne said, I mean, there were times when I'm like, I we're getting behind, you know, I'd get up at two in the morning to write till five, till 7 a.m. when we went out or, you know, as Leanne said, every time on a plane, you know, I had the blog open writing. And so, you know, it, it was a lot of work, but, you know, it's awesome because now, you know, we go back and look through it and it's like, oh, yeah, I didn't even remember that, you know, story. <laughs> we relive it, our memories, you know, it's really for our memories. So that we're 80 years old, we can be reading it over. And I love the fact that Kyle printed it out and sent it to my father and he read every page, <laughs> 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 which he loved our story. So even though he's, you know, not going to take a trip like this in his life, he certainly can, can uh, live it with, with us. So. Did you and encourage what, your, and, your children to do some journaling themselves? 
Yes, they did. They did. Um, they were not as uh, interested as putting it up on, you know, out to the world, <laughs> but that was important. And, and in fact, um, having an uh, educational element to every day was important. So they did take classes online um, and uh, they, they, they did do a lot of, in terms of investigating the histories of where we were going and things like that. So we made sure that there was an educational bent to every day because what a great opportunity to make, to learn about the world, right? Absolutely. And you got to see nine of the uh, wonders of the world, you know, different lists, uh, the modern world, the natural world, the ancient world. Uh, I see that you've written down, you've got 90 museums, 25 national parks, 170 religious places of worship, mm -hmm. ni 91 UNESCO sites. Um, and it's just incredible all the different things that you've been able to document on uh, globalteenadventures.com. Now, when you're looking back, what could you have done better or differently, you know, kind of if, if you had to do it all over again? What, what kind of lessons would you do? So, so I do want to throw in one. We had all seven wonders of the modern world on the schedule. <laughs> so we had Petra and the Colosseum in Rome. So, we will get there so that, on our next trip. <laughs> that, was, that was one of our low points when we had to cancel because all the kids, like every, you know, every wonder of the world, we'd hold up, you know, our one family picture, you know, the Great Wall and two. And so... That was something the kids got really into, and so that's okay. We're we, gonna make we it happen. We still have two more to go. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it happen after COVID, uh, and, and the world is in a in a different place. But um, as far as lessons so learned that you would have done differently, done, if done differently, I wish we had spent a little bit more time before the trip. We were so busy just doing the logistical stuff. Um, we did spend some time um, kind of preparing for the countries beforehand. But I think I think I wish I had done a little bit more in terms of that. I think you can never do enough um, of reading about other cultures and other histories before you showed up. And we did do some. I wish I had done, you know, three or four times more uh, of it. But now I can enjoy it in retrospect. So we're we're learning. You know, our, our minds are open to learning about more cultures. What are? Yeah, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I it's it's. I I think. It was such a successful trip that I'm not sure. I mean, what Leanne said, definitely. But in terms of the trip itself, you know, one of the things, you know, is, is that we got from you is kind of hike your own hike, mm -hmm. right? And so this was our, like, we were getting people saying, oh, you need to go here over here. and But in the end, it's like, this was our own hike, our own right. trip. And so, you know, for us to kind of plan it, you know, end to end and pick the places was something that I think was was really special um, for us to experience. But I, I can't think of a lot that I would have done differently yeah. other than try and try and leave three months earlier <laughs> 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 and avoid the COVID. <laughs> Having a better crystal ball. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, yeah. what about how you guys have changed personally? I mean, here you guys are both. Harvard Business School graduates, you had uh, in kind of a, a good corporate life at stamps.com, uh, Kyle and Leanne, you've also had a good professional life as well. And now all of a sudden you went on this big trip. How has it transformed you, maybe changed your values in certain ways? I know you talked a little bit about minimizing your stuff and getting rid of stuff. Any other thoughts that you have and how do you look forward to the next stage of your life or your career? You know, I have to say, um, really just being completely, you know, humbled and honored to have had this opportunity, really. Um, you know, so few people in the world could or would make this happen for their lives or their children. So I, I just feel so privileged that we had had this opportunity that I feel that I have this kind of need to really kind of advanced. I've done philanthropic work in equity already. And I think that it just kind of re-motivates me in a way to to help move the the world forward in terms of humanitarian efforts or or just just really trying to bring the world a little closer. And so I already do this work 
you know, in, in my life as, as a volunteer, but I guess it just really motivates me more because of the people that I got to meet and just to, to really experience their challenges and their, their perspectives and just the kindness that was continually shown to us, like every day. Mm-hmm. Um, even when, uh, you know, I dropped money, people would pick it up and give it to me. <laughs> I was like, you know, I mean, I dropped my passport in the airport. He doesn't know about that. Someone picked it up and gave it to me. And what? I was just like, wow. <laughs> like, it's just um, amazing to me the amount of kindness of people just, uh, you know, we actually were in New Zealand and these people walked up to us and just gave us free tickets. They're just like, hey, we're not going to use these. You want them? <laughs> like, in, you know, in L.A., I think they would be trying to charge us like two times the price. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't really. Uh, yeah. But I'm just saying like that kind, that overwhelming kindness of that's out in the world. And I, and, and I know we, the media kind of focuses so much on what's bad in the world. Um, but you have to look at your every day. What is good about your world today? And let that kind of just motivate you for to, to, to spread that joy? Yeah, I think for me, it's it really stretched and challenged kind of my thinking and perspectives on different areas. And I think it goes back to, you know, it's one thing to read about something, and, but it's totally different to experience it. And so there were a few different areas, I think, that really hit home. One is you know, places we were where there was, you know, oppression, you know, war, you know, occupation, like, you know, seeing what people went through, you know, and there, there were a couple powerful kind of moving moments, you know, in, in Cambodia, we were driving with our local tour guide by the killing fields. And he's like, yeah, Pol Pot killed my father and three uncles. I mean, like, talking to this guy, you know, and he starts crying. It's like, oh, my God, like this is, you know, it's one thing to read Pol Pot wiped out a generation. It's another than to be talking to, you know, somebody who lost, you know, a huge part of his family, you know, in that process. We went to the Dachau concentration camp in, in Munich, and, you know, that was very powerful, you know, just being there and, you know, and, and getting an understanding of, you know, what they went through. Uh, the Museum of Occupation in Estonia and Latvia were, were very powerful. You know, I mean, they were getting occupied, deported to Siberia, killed in the middle of the night. And so, you know, there were a lot of things where you just like saw over and over again. And it just gave you a deeper kind of understanding and appreciation for, you know, what people go through, you know, in, in different places in the world. Uh, another area was religion. You know, I think we're Catholic, and so, you know, in Los Angeles, we go to church and we, you know, live our Catholic life, but never really exposed to other religions. And so it was pretty amazing, you know, you know, you saw 170, you know, religious places of worship. We went to, you know, Buddhist temples, Shinto shrines, Sikh temples, Hindu temples, you know, Jewish synagogues, like... And that was really like, you know, Muslim mosques. And it's like, you see how many people are passionate about what they believe in. And, you know, it's like, well, how do I reconcile that with my faiths and beliefs? And, you know, it really, again, kind of stretches your thinking and and gives you a deeper appreciation for religious diversity. Uh, Another is environmental. We are killing our planet, you know, and again, it's, not that you don't know these things, but when you go places firsthand, you know, you go to Antarctica and, you know, the seals, you know, the wa- wa- weather is warmer. So the baby seals are being born later. Their mothers leave in October and now they're dying because they can't survive on their own. You know, penguins with the rain, when they're first born, they don't have waterproof fur. And so now the rain is killing the penguins, you know. At, right after we were in Antarctica, they had 
a record heat wave and like 30 percent of like the ice shelf melted you yeah. know i mean and we witnessed we and, witnessed you know, the you know the icebergs kind of crashing yeah. down on, on multiple occasions on our trip so and you know we go to ecuador the amazon rainforest and you see oil drilling you know and you know places in the rainforest just being wiped out you know for oil drilling you know and on everest and it, you probably saw the receding glaciers Yep, the yes. receding glaciers yes, there, and delicious. you know it is interesting because in Indonesia we did a volunteer week teaching English, and so my nephew Corey and I were teaching environmental conservation to sixth graders, and you know the the mentor guy, our our group guy, was like, "Look, there's no recycling here. Like at this point, we just want them not to burn trash and not to throw trash on the ground." Like, that's your whole goal to try and instill in them, you know? So we just saw places, you know, Halong Bay is this beautiful UNESCO site. The bay was littered with plastic bottles, you know, just all over the place. So, you know, Which I think... wasn't the case 20 years ago, the first time I went mm. to Halong Bay. So it was it was disturbing to me to see that kind of, that difference over time. And so that, the, you know, we come back and I'm like, okay, I'm going to think about buying plastic water bottles, you know, and not going to do it, you know? and minimizing, you know, electricity use and things like that. So, you know, I think there were just these areas where it just, you know, we came back with such an appreciation of what we have here. And then, you know, how do you, you know, how, how do you take what we learned and turn around and, you know, try and give back to the rest of the world? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And so, uh, this is such an amazing story. I really want to encourage everybody to go to your website and learn a lot more. And where can people find out more about it? Is it just globalteenadventures.com? Yep. Globalteenadventures.com. We will put on, uh, you know, any books that we will be publishing from this. And um, just, we, you know, we'd love to hear from you. So there'll be a link on there, how you can get in touch with us. And uh, if you're thinking about doing a trip like this, we'd love to, uh, you know, help you out with advice. Fantastic. Kyle, Leanne, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, we're going to hear yeah. about your, oh, oh for, I forgot one last thing. When's your last question is, when's your next trip? <laughs> post, <laughs> post COVID, I imagine. Where's our next trip? Well, so it, it's interesting because, you know, we were talking about the importance of keeping up the blog. Well, Leanne and I knew, you know, one of our goals was going to be to write a book about the trip. And so, you know, we, you know, kind of that second phase post corporate life is kind of, you know, writing books and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and focusing on the travel aspects. Our youngest will be in college in six years. So I think we were looking at it as when all the kids are in college, you know, is, you know, we'll travel our, our again. Travel, we'll get our travel. travel again, but less you know. less people and less complexity. Yeah, um, you know, More if, beaches. if any of the kids are, <laughs> yeah. are available, you take the kids. But it, it's become for us, I think, a long term goal. You know, we were it's talking the other now. day, and a post COVID world. You know, when the kids are out, it's like. Hey, you can live, you know, live here for six months and go travel for six months so, or if travel for nine months. We'll see months how the world and, is and you know, what we can afford. <laughs> it, but it's it's something, you know, I think that is going to be part of our life, you know, for, you know, the next 20 years yeah. is, is really try. I mean, there's so many parts of the world we didn't get to see. Yeah, we got the travel just, bug. Just in, just in those three <laughs> months we had to cancel, we had 20 countries planned, yeah, so. you know, awesome. Africa, the Middle East, you know, uh, Southern Europe. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. us on. Yes. This has been yeah. great and good to see you. <laughs> Likewise. Right. Okay. See you guys.